uh, 2013 uh, Water Forum. Uh, we use these forums to highlight uh, topics of uh, the issues that are important to our watershed, as well as the watersheds throughout the, the Northeast and the, uh, and the nation. Um, we like to make these participatory, and you will see we have quite an uh, active participation aspect to uh, today's program, later in the program. Uh, today's topic is climate change. Um, before we get started, I wanted to say a few words about ORS. Um, ORS identifies its mission as science-based advocacy for the Concord, Aspen, and Sudbury Rivers. And I just realized I neglected to say who I am and, uh, and why I'm up here. Uh, my name is Pete Shanahan. I'm the president of ORS, and I'm also an environmental engineer and a part-time lecturer in environmental engineering at MIT. So I'm very much a water resources professional. And my interest, and the reason I so much enjoy being associated with ORS, is because they do science-based advocacy. We, we basically um, work on the science to help us do our advocacy. Uh, Sue Flint is here as our chief scientist and has been out monitoring the river on a very regular basis for many years now. We have a very solid database to show the water quality of our river how it's changed over the years. Basically, we've taken that data to demonstrate that the river has needed to be improved, that there's water treatment that was needed. We've used that information to advocate for improved water treatment, and we're seeing the results in improved water quality in the river. We have a ways to go yet. We'll continue to monitor the water quality to continue to make our case to invest in infrastructure and invest in water treatment and in uh, non-point source pollution control but we're very much based on the science, and I, I, in particular, very, very comfortable and very proud of how ORS does its work. Um, one of the things I did want to mention, we also have some fun occasionally, and uh, one of our fun events is coming up on April 17th. It's the uh, ORS Wild and Scenic Film Festival. At the back of the room, there are some cards which have information on that. It is April 17th uh, from 7 to 10 p.m. at the um, Amazing Things Art Center in Framingham. And you can uh, find information about this in the, uh, the back of the room. It's a, it's a, a great uh, evening of films. Uh, and it's very pertinent to today's topic. The, the uh, topic is um, a climate of change. And the focus is on climate change in uh, this year's film festival. Um, in keeping with our emphasis on science-based advocacy, uh, today's topic is climate, uh, climate disruption. And of course, if you follow the news and uh, statements in the public forum, there are still people who question whether climate change is real. Um, the science is unequivocal. The greenhouse effect is a real effect. The levels of CO2 and other greenhouse gases have been rising and continue to rise in the atmosphere. And climate change is real. This is um, the cover of the most recent newsletter uh, from ORS. Uh, Allison Fieldjuma, who, uh, who you just saw, will be a speaker later, um, did a very nice article on, uh, on climate change. I wanted to show you one of the, this is an illustration that was in the article. This is data from the uh, National Climatic Data Center, and it is the rank of um, the average temperature in each state in 2012. And so they have 118 years of record. This shows where the temperature ranked in that, uh, in that record. A number of 118 means 2012 was the hottest year on record. If there was a rank of one, it would be the coldest year on record. There's nothing there that's even close to one. You can see how much, how, how warm, uh, particularly the Northeast is, most of the states, 2012 was the warmest year on record. <laughs> There's very little doubt that climate change is real and that it's affecting us. And it's something that we need to plan for and anticipate. Um, we have a group of distinguished, knowledgeable speakers today who can help us understand the issues and some of the, some of the potential uh, fixes to this problem, some of the things we need to do to deal with climate change. And I want to thank them all for being here. Um, I also want to thank the uh, Sudbury Aspect Concord 
Wild and Scenic uh, River Stewardship Council, which provided funding for the forum, and also for Clock Tower Place for this very nice venue. Um, I also want to thank uh, the ORS staff and ORS volunteers for helping put this together. It was a, a, quite a bit of work to arrange all this, and it's really, uh, really looks like we're going to have a very nice day here today. Um, I'd like to also, I'd like to now introduce our first speaker. Uh, State Senator Jamie Eldridge is um, the state senator for the Middlesex and Worcester District. Um, he is my state senator, and I'm very pleased to be able to say that. He is a strong advocate for the environment. Um, he is um, vice chair of the Environment Committee in the Senate. He also <laughs> chaired the Water Infrastructure Finance Commission. And uh, also at the back table, there is a um, three-page um, <laughs> listing of the many um, uh, pieces of legislation related to the environment that Jamie has sponsored. And it's quite an impressive list, and I encourage you to take a look at it. It's, it, 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 it's really wonderful to have someone that can advocate for the, for the environment like Jamie does. He's also known for his work on electoral and uh, ethics reform, proven public, uh, public education, and also his work to stimulate the economy. So with that, I'll Turn it over to Jamie. Thank you for uh, introducing our uh, forum today. Well, thank you, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful turnout this morning. And I'm happy to talk to you about the recommendations of the Water Infrastructure Finance Commission, which have been turned into a number of pieces of legislation, which is the, the handout that, uh, that Pete had referenced. But first, I just want to say that um, it's, it's, you know, I rely upon ORS so often to um, get their advice and expertise on environmental issues that impact a good part of my district, especially the towns, uh, you know, Maynard, Hudson, Sudbury, out to, to the Marlboro, Westbury area, in other words, the communities that the Acid River runs through um, as we engage in further discussions over some of the EPA permitting and, and uh, the nutrient issues on, in that river. So I, I really appreciate Allison um, and her, her and her staff have exp expertise on this, and I think we're going to be, you know, having further discussions as this issue sort of heats up. The um, I, I know that the, the focus today is, is water related to climate change, and it was interesting because the, the Water and Infrastructure Finance Commission, which was a bill that I filed in my first term as a senator in 2009, it was a, a carryover bill from former state senator Pam Beezer when she retired, and I was successful in getting it passed and then asking the governor to appoint me as co-chair along with Representative Carolyn Dykema, who's also an excellent advocate for the environment. Um, she's a legislator from the Holliston Hopkinson area. And the commission uh, met from 2010 to 2012. It was made up of a diverse group of stakeholders. And, and when I say diverse group of stakeholders as far as water issues, you're talking about municipal officials, you're talking about contractors, uh, water districts, so uh, you know, water, uh, water works folks, as well as the environmental community. I think it was really, really important that when we created the language for who was going to be in that commission, of course, the, the makeup of any commission uh, often determines what the rec recommendations of, of that commission is going to be. And we made sure to have significant representation from a couple different environmental leaders. Uh, we had a representative of the DP. Uh, we had someone from the Conservation Law Foundation. We had someone from the uh, Clean Water Action. And uh, of course, and I know he's going to be speaking just a little bit later, uh, we had uh, Bob Zimmerman uh, from Charles River Watershed Association as another appointee. So we, we made sure as we were discussing water infrastructure needs that we, we weren't taking out of the equation uh, the issue of how we can improve the environment, how can we reduce nutrients in our rivers and streams and, and when we're talking about delivering clean water to people's homes, let's make sure we're also talking about making sure there's a clean water supply for recreational uses, for our, our fish and wildlife. It's not just about getting the water to our homes and businesses, but it's about uh, water as an environmental issue for, for sort of every uh, organism in, 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 in society. And, and that was reflected in, in one of the, the key parts of the, the, the commission and just to so to show people the breadth of the, the commission report, this is the commission report. It's available on my website, so you're welcome to download it, or you can call my office to, to ask for a copy. And 
one of the statements early on in the commission was that uh, a well-maintained, reliable water infrastructure system is vital to the Commonwealth's health, economy, environment, and cultural vitality. So that, that was a, a main thrust going into the meetings of this commission, is that it wasn't just about delivering water to people's homes, but it's about the whole host of issues and really values of why we value water and how important it is to us in our society. The, the major challenge of the commission was, was coming up with what are the actual water infrastructure needs for the state. And water infrastructure needs can be, you know, how do we replace uh, pipes that in, in many communities are from, still from the 19th century uh, or from the early 1900s. Um, I know that one of the recounting of uh, an individual involved with the big dig in Boston was finding wooden pipes underneath Boston uh, when the big dig uh, revitalization effort was going on and that's that's not just the case in Boston that exists all across the state not to mention there's still lead pipes and you know pipes made up of other things across the state uh, but it's also about wastewater treatment facilities it's also about you know talking about decentralized uh, systems it's also about how do we protect aquifers in terms of protecting open space so all these areas of water and infrastructure I don't I don't want you to think it's just about sort of the the typical sort of 1970s style uh, massive wastewater treatment facilities, but we really want to be a lot more thoughtful, a lot more innovative. And the, the need in terms of soliciting surveys from water districts and environmentalists and municipal officials across the state was that the, the drinking water uh, infrastructure needs for the next 20 years for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are $10.2 billion. Yes, that's a billion dollars. And for wastewater projects, it was $11.2 billion. So uh, just over $21 billion in water infrastructure needs for Massachusetts. We were not able to get a scientific analysis of the stormwater needs, but the consensus of the commission was that for the next 20 years, the stormwater needs for the Commonwealth was about $18 billion. So uh, I'm as I'm sure you can understand, it's difficult raising these numbers when uh, clearly the legislature is struggling we're trying to address transportation infrastructure needs uh, for the Commonwealth, and obviously that's something that's going on right at this moment. But I, I think it was important to, to raise these issues now so we can prepare. And in many respects, you know, that's what we're all trying to do in terms of climate change, is how do we prepare for what we unfortunately know is going to happen. Um, we're all doing our part to reduce climate change, but knowing that it's, it's here and it's, it's going to get worse, what can we do to prepare? One of the, the key findings uh, from the commission was that very clearly that environmental and public health concerns need to be addressed. These include uh, nutrient controls and stormwater mitigation. And so going into uh, those sort of concerns, uh, we had a number of key recommendations. One of them, which is not a surprise at all, is we need to increase funding, we need to increase funding for water infrastructure. So uh, some, of these some of these recommendations were uh, sustaining current programs and investments in the state and state and federal level, including in particular state and federal contributions to the water and sewer state revolving funds. Uh, that's partly out of a concern of what's going to happen to federal cuts, including cuts to the SRF program in terms of the federal money that flows through that state program. Uh, it's also concerns about making sure that the funding in the SRF revolving loan fund is maintained in a very difficult uh, fiscal environment. Uh, but it was also a new idea, and this was sort of speaking to the fact that I think there was a lot of frustration, uh, whether from uh, environmentalists, whether, whether from water districts, whether from municipal officials, that the state wasn't doing enough to support innovation. And when you talk about innovation, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I think that the talk that Bob Zimmerman is going to give on what's happened in Littleton is exactly the kind of thing the state needs to encourage and by encourage, what I mean is it needs to provide more upfront capital, uh, more grants to encourage more innovative ways to treat water. In other words, not the, the traditional sort of massive wastewater treatment facility, but talking about decentralized ways, which is much, much better for the environment. We're talking about discharge into the ground, and of course not discharge into our rivers and streams. We're talking about innovation in terms of new ways to treat water, and even just simple things like making sure the state better protects open space uh, to make sure that we don't have runoff problems to begin with. Uh, but part of the idea in terms of providing a financial incentive for that was to create this new trust fund. So this trust fund, as proposed, would create a $200 million fund that could be used for a mixed program of direct payments to cities and towns, low interest loans, and grants. 
that again is separate from the SRF program and could support innovative ideas like, like I believe are, are happening in Littleton and many, many other towns. Um, and, and finally, incent all communities, authorities, and districts to utilize rate structures that reflect the full cost of water supply and wastewater treatment. And this is an issue that came up over and over again, is that I'm the first to acknowledge that there are certainly some cities and towns across the state, more often than not in sort of uh, poor, sort of uh, older cities, sort of the old mill cities like a, a Fitchburg or a Springfield, where water rates are quite, quite high. But the reality is that many, many of our communities, including this region, uh, we're paying less than what it really costs to treat our water as well as to protect the environment how water is treated. And so um, we need to make sure to have that discussion that when we're talking about providing more support for water infrastructure, that's not just about the state and federal government, but it's about each of us um, having that conversation at the local level about what our rate structure is to pay for water, especially when it comes to incentivizing conservation practices. Um, so the, 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 the funding part is critical. And then as far as the environmental sustainability, which hasn't gotten as much of attention uh, with respect to the Water Infrastructure Finance Commission, that's really why I wanted to highlight it today, is that uh, some of the recommendations that came out of the commission include encouraging investments and regulations that are aligned with environmentally sustainable <coughs> principles. This means prioritizing solutions that use technologies that are environmentally and financially sustainable over the lifetime of the assets, promoting water conservation and water reuse, reducing the release of nutrients in watersheds, encourage energy efficiency, prioritize solutions that keep water within its basin while protecting water quality, protect water sources through watershed protection programs, encourage more effective water management, excuse me, encourage more effective management of water resources through long-term planning, optimization of resources and management efficiencies, encourage integrated resource management where waste are viewed as resources from which revenues can be generated, and finally, increase regulatory flexibility to better direct funding to projects that deliver the highest public benefit. And I, I want to be clear there is that there were some efforts by members of the commission to suggest that we need to reduce or pull back on regulations, and we really pushed back against that and made sure that that was not in the commission recommendations. But I, I think some of the commentary there is a frustration from some people in communities that were trying to adopt more innovative ways to treat water uh, that in many respects were more cost efficient, but uh, whether it was the DEP, whether it was the Water uh, Pollution Abatement Trust, were being rather rigid in terms of embracing these newer ways to treat water that were sort of more harmonious and more environmentally sustainable. And so that's going to be a complex conversation, but I think it's one that we need to have, we need to have happen at the state level. So these are all recommendations in this commission, and if someone has chaired a couple of commissions as a legislator, you don't just want this report to you know, end up uh, collecting dust on a shelf, as you want to actually turn it into legislation that has action items and has a chance of passing. And what I'm, I'm very pleased to announce just in the first few months of the first, first uh, uh, year of the legislative session is that there has been a great amount of momentum on passing legislation out of the recommendations of the commission. Um, in, on the day that all legislators were sworn in again, uh, the first week of January, uh, Senate Pre President Therese Murray listed five top priorities of hers. One of them was water infrastructure, specifically mentioning the Water Infrastructure Finance Commission. So that's very, very encouraging. Um, in large part, that become, that I, I believe that's probably because she represents a large part of the Cape. And of course, as we know uh, from the Conservation Law Foundation lawsuit, and just, um, you know, if you go to the Cape knowing that uh, there is no uh, public water supply in the Cape and they're really approaching a crisis and they need to do something to uh, provide more financial support to find a solution for the Cape. Um, otherwise, it's something that could affect the tourism industry and obviously people, people's uh, homes and businesses on the Cape. But it was really, really exciting to hear her talk about that. Um, last December, I was on a trip with a couple of uh, Governor Patrick's top environmental uh, regulators, including Commissioner Kimmel, to Israel to learn more about the water infrastructure system in that country and to come back with some of the ideas, some of which turned up in the legislation we filed. So clearly the administration realizes that uh, water innovation, water infrastructure is something that Massachusetts needs to take on. Uh, 
Governor Patrick has filed an environmental bond bill, and so we're hoping um, as that makes its way to the legislature that part of, that, part of the funding for that can be for water infrastructure. So one of the bills that speaks directly to that, and again, this is now in the, in the handout that, that perhaps some of you picked up uh, just outside, is a, a bill that would create a water infrastructure bond bill. It's House 690, an act relative to municipal assistance for clean water and economic development infrastructure. This is the proposal to create this $200 million trust fund that would uh, set aside money, including for more innovative approaches uh, to dealing with water infrastructure, which I think you know, part of the innovation is addressing climate change. And uh, in this proposal, up to 10% of the funds would be set aside for projects using innovative or green technology that could, could address some of the climate change concerns that we, we all have. So I wanted to highlight that bill. Uh, another bill is Senate 945, an act to mitigate water resources impacts really known as the water banking bill. So this would give clear authority to cities and towns and water districts uh, to uh, allow for a fee to be charged. And this money can be used for local recharge of storm wastewater, water re reuse, retrofitting properties with water saving devices, fixing leaky pipes and land acquisition for wellhead protection. So this speaks to the fact that for many, many communities, we're not completely capturing the externalities, the costs, of, of treating our water and by creating this option of a, of a water banking fee, if you will, uh, it would allow uh, that money to be used for many purposes in cities and towns, including to address some of the, the changes that will come uh, through climate change for our water systems. Also wanted to highlight Senate 358, an act relative to best management practices in water. And this is in, in, in some ways sort of the, the next step, I think, by BP um, having uh, pretty much finished the, the swimming regulations in terms of you know how do we improve the quality of our, our, our water and our rivers and streams and, then, and what the bill would do is it would be charged the DP with adopting best management practices uh, for the clean water SRF and the drinking water SRF uh, direct the DP to establish guidelines for best management practices so this is like uh, things like full cost pricing which I talked about a little bit earlier financial management and the use of a stormwater enterprise fund and so I, I think what this is getting to is for cities and towns, for water districts across the Commonwealth that are looking to apply for SRF funds, or hopefully in the future for this new uh, $200 million trust fund, um, should there be a requirement for every water district, for every city and town to have an enterprise fund to make sure we maintain the current infrastructure we have. Unfortunately, many water districts, especially ones that are extremely small, just have one or two employees, they keep on pushing off those costs. It's often politically difficult to, to raise the discussion of raising water rates within a city or town. And uh, the maintenance gets pushed on and off until the whole system breaks and you, know, you see the headline of a bit of a boil water order having to happen for a week or two. Instead, let's make sure that every water district has an enterprise fund setting aside money uh, for, for water maintenance. Another bill, uh, House 2931, an act to promote innovative water management in the Commonwealth. One of the, the facts that I think probably some people here know is that the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center established as part of the Green Communities Act in 2008. I was very, very proud to support. Uh, of course, the focus was on clean energy for many, many years, but what has been added uh, sort of to the portfolio of the Clean Energy Center has now been a water innovation and, what, and, and new technology to treat water. So that's something that was initiated by the administration. And what this bill uh, would do is it would uh, create a pilot initiative that would support the Mass Clean Energy Center to support uh, excuse me, uh, new technologies that uh, entrepreneurs, that cities and towns and municipal officials might have. So the pilot project would provide funding uh, to innovative projects that are happening across the state. And again, that, that's something that could speak to addressing climate change as, as a part of treating water in our cities and towns. So that, I'm hoping that that can be sort of a complement to what the administration is already sort of doing in terms of looking at water innovation. Uh, to be honest, I think their main thrust in terms of innovation is that it's a source of jobs for Massachusetts, it's a source of economic growth, and that's very, very important, but let's make sure that while we're doing that, we're making sure to support environmentally sustainable principles and making sure that we're um, dealing with climate change issues um, within our water system. 
And then finally, I just wanted to mention, mention this is the, isn't a bill, but this is a, an effort that I'm trying to get into the budget, uh, going into the, the FY14 budget this year, is to bring back the Drinking Water Supply Protection Program. This was a program that was started in 1982, uh, under the great Governor Dukakis, and it was funded at the time at $10 million. And then uh, since FY02, the previous recession, the program ceased to exist. And what this would uh, provide is money. It would provide money for the acquisition of land or interest in land for the purposes of protecting your current or future drinking water supply support source. So in other words, is there an aquifer in town where all the land around it isn't properly protected? Let's make sure we don't have commercial development there uh, that can negatively affect that water supply. I, I dealt with this issue uh, very directly in one of the towns I represented here which has the, the Fitchburg commuter rail running through it. Uh, unfortunately, one of the, the railroad lines, one of the private railroad lines that brings its commercial freight through that area, decided to build a parking lot literally over uh, Ayer's only aquifer, only source of, of water supply. And despite the fact that we fought back uh, because of the preemption, the federal preemption for railroad lines, uh, we were not, not able to stop it. We did get some protections in there in terms of water monitoring thanks to Attorney General Martha Coakley, but imagine if this program uh, of, of providing this set of funding had been there uh, to possibly allow that town to purchase that land and make sure that that aquifer uh, wouldn't suffer the consequences of an oil spill or a chemical spill with all that commercial freight uh, passing right over it. So, um, so I, I wanted to highlight that program because there are, are also efforts that we're going to be trying to put into the budget. But again, most of the most of the effort is through getting this legislation passed. I think the idea is to create a, a water infrastructure package that will include many of the bills that I referenced in one big package that we could pass through the House and Senate. And, and again, I think it's something that it's, it's time for us to, to deal with water infrastructure. Again, I know the focus right now at the state level is transportation infrastructure. But I think in many respects, the two things go hand in hand, whether you're talking about uh, you know, addressing global warming, whether you're talking about economic development, whether you're talking about best serving our cities and towns. So um, I'm happy to talk to folks uh, later on during the conference. Thank you very much for asking ask me to come speak here. And I look forward to working with you on this very important issue. Thanks.